Okay, so we're going to talk about ultrasound for labor epidural analgesia. When is competency reached? Objective is we're going to determine when competency is reached when using ultrasound for labor epidural placement. I have two questions. I want to show a hands. Who here uses ultrasound for labor epidural catheter placement? Please raise your hand. Not many. Okay. Who uses ultrasound in all patients? Okay. That's what I... I Good, I saw one person here, that, that's good. So we'll talk about it. Okay, first of all, why is it important to assess competency? Well, why? What reasons? It facilitates learning. It can, it's also a research tool and it can be a basis for certification and or credentialing. So what is competency? Competency is not mastery, and it, which infers expertise. It does uh, infer that you can have adequate performance and it, it's equal to proficiency. So what about ultrasound for labor analgesia? Not everyone uses it. Well, the failed epidural rate can be as high as 5%, and we all know that ultrasound is increasingly being popular, so used for all kinds of different blocks, like intersaint, scaling blocks, and popliteal, and all that. It does improve block success rate, it increases the efficiency, and it is considered the gold standard in regional anesthesia. Not for labor epidurals, but for regional anesthesia. And in fact, in January 2008, NICE, uh, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, recommended the use of ultrasound in all patients, but it has not come to fruition. It is really not that popular in the United States. So we'll, we'll talk reasons. So, okay, so ultrasound advantages. What are the advantages? It finds the landmarks. The technique does decrease the epidural attempts, it does decrease epidural site placements, and it does decrease the epidural failure rate. It does not decrease the postural puncture headache rate, it does improve the learning curve, and it is roughly around the same amount of time, although it does take a little longer. But in the whole scheme of a 20 minute placement, it's not that much more. So you all know the landmarks, and typically what you'll do is you'll go through the supraspinatus ligament, through the interspinous ligament and the ligamentum flavum, and then you pop into the epidural space. And the standard in the technique, you want to transverse the uh, ligamentum flavum, you usually target the epidural space, which is about three to five millimeters, and you confirm with either a loss of saline uh, or to air, and then you go ahead and thread your catheter. Now here's the anatomy, and it, this is almost like a show and tell lecture here. And uh, so you see the anterior uh, longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, and then here's the ligamentum flavum right here. And then here's the, the, the vertebral bodies right here. And really where you want to go and what you're looking for when you do ultrasound is to, to go right there is you're going to look. So it's really hard, and especially in a morbidly obese patient, because you have all these structures that you have to go through, and you can see all this like uh, epidural fat that's around there. So it can make things a little difficult. So here's, here's a typical anatomy, and this is a transverse. And, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I'm gonna make sure how I do this. Um, so. Uh, Here's, you look right here, and then it's sort of like, you know, what are you looking at? So I'll, I'll just try and help you here. So here's really what you're, you're seeing through. So here's the body right here. Here's the, um, uh, the spinous processes. Here's the uh, transverse processes here, and here's the facet joint. So you can, and then what you really want to do is go for this sort of equal sign that's, that's right there. And there's the body that's in and there. So hopefully that helps a little bit and look for that equal sign. Okay, so, or you can look for the, or the flying bat sign, so the equal or flying bat. So as you're looking here, this is the back right here, and then here's the posterior door right here, and then this would be the anterior door. And you sort of see this equal sign is where it would go, and in between is the doral sac or where the CSF is. And when you measure, you could go right here, and then it has calibers on the ultrasound machine, and it can tell exactly how deep. And if you look here, it says about 4.5. And up here, you see this uh, flying bat, and you sort of can see an impression of a flying bat around there. So that's how that looks. So here's the equal signs. And that's really where you want to go. 
Now, transverse view, so that's how you hold the, the probe. So what you're looking at is you want to get in between the vertebral processes. And really what I do is feel in between first, I'll mark it, and then I'll measure going to the transverse plane. And then this, this is in real time. And then this is just a transverse ultrasound view of, of looking at it. Uh, here's uh, articulating processes here. Here's the posterior dora. Here's the anterior. And you're going from here to here. And that's uh, where you want to look, uh, measure. So when you, we did, a, did some studies, and the correlation coefficient is actually pretty high. It's over 0.9. So anything above 0.7 has a high correlation. So ultrasound using the transverse step has a high correlation. Now, that's the transverse view. Now we're going to do the, the longitudinal view or the sagittal. And where that is, is it's the long view here. And you'll sort of see like a serpent or on the ultrasound, but that you're going in between the vertebral bodies. So you sort of see this, the serpent thing, the spinous processes, and, and there's the, the vertebral bodies, and that's right there. And this looks a little different, and this just shows that there's different angles. So you don't really want to go straight, but you go the angle as you're almost placing the TUI needle. So here's some superimpositions. That arrow shows exactly where you're going to measure. Now, here's the longitudinal view. And that's in real time. And then that's a view there. OK, so here's a longitudinal view. And you can see the sawtooth or the serpentine in this posterior dora. Anterior dora is right there. And that's how you, you look at it. And this just shows more graphic anatomy. And go in, and you get the, here's the ligamentum flavum right there and you want to go, and I still look for the equal sign, you can still see it. So both the transverse and the longitudinal views, you can look for the equal signs. So what about clinical depth versus longitudinal depth? That, that has a, also a high correlation. So if you do the, the longitudinal view and you do the transverse view, its correlation is, is, above, is above 0.9, so it's highly correlated. So here's real time, and this is what I do when I walk into a room. First, I'll use an, uh, a sterile indelible uh, pencil. Go ahead and make my mark. I'll look at the, that's the long axis view. So I'm looking there, and you can look right there on it. And then I hit the caliber, and then you can just measure. You see me measuring all the way down to the, the, the top equal sign. And there's our measurement right there. It's around four-ish. So that's the longitudinal. You'll see the, uh, the, the sawtooth appearance. And then I'll switch to the transverse. And there you go. So you go the transverse view in the same area. And the, the other thing, too, is about when, when you're holding your probe, you can actually, the best view that you get, so if you angle it sort of this way, then that's the, your, your TUI needle should go that angle. If it's straight ahead, then that, that should be your best angle for your TUI needle. You can see the equal sign, and what I'm doing here is just uh, I'm measuring with the calibers. And it says right there, about four-ish. So I confirmed it both, both longitudinal and transverse view. And I think the whole time period that you saw was only about a, a minute and uh, 30 seconds. So that's that. Uh, so what are limitations? So it's not foolproof, and if it was so great, we'd all be using it. And the, the fact is, is that not everyone's using it. So there are slight differences that can occur when you use ultrasound. And one of the things is, is that when you place the blunt TUI needle in, so when you're pushing the needle against the back, you can, you can miss some millimeters right there. So that can give you a difference. Also, it, it's not foolproof. It just because I, you know, tell a trainee or a resident that, you know, it's four, you just don't indiscriminately stick it in. You still want to rely on tactile sensation in using the loss of resistant technique. That's sort of like, you know, your kid wants to go out or something with their friends and, you know, well, you know, if they tell you to jump off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge? No. So same type of principles uh, apply. And then usually the clinical depth is greater than the ultrasound depth in a couple reasons is sometimes the epidural needle can be off midline. So if you're off midline, 
then you, when you're measuring and you're slightly off, then that has an angle to it. And then the other issue is, is sometimes you're not perpendicular and you might be like this way. And when you measure, you're just measuring perpendicular instead of like an angle of where you're placing your TUI needle. And I'll, I'll show you a slide on that. So this is a really good uh, uh, sh uh, view of this. So they're not totally perpendicular and you can see the angle right there. And if you look, so if your angle's this, so when it measures, it measures this way. So if you're putting your needle that way, it's like the hypotenuse and, you know, cosines and sines and, and all that. So I'm not really, I forget all that stuff. Okay. You can also use ultrasound for caudal blocks, which is really good. And in patients that have like Harrington rods or real difficult or they're dwarfs and uh, they, you know, curve back and they're really bad or say like the, the presenting part and they're really worried about it. You can also do ultrasound and you can see right here. So here's the sacrum here and you can use ultrasound and you can put that in. And I've done that before with a couple patients, Harrington rods, back surgery, and they just, you can't get it in because uh, you have this scar tissue formation and you can use it for caudal blocks. Now, what about competency? So we talked about using ultrasound. So it's multifaceted. You need education, there's a definite learning curve, and then we all know the M Miller's Pyramid of uh, Clinical Confidence, which is that they know, they know how to, they show, and then they do. And this, it's amazing, at least in my institution, we're going over to milestones now, you know, and it just seems like, so, what, you know, what are they, where's, what milestone are they at? And to me, it seems like it's based on the Miller's Pyramid, that you go up these uh, different uh, categories. Okay, so how do you assess uh, technical competency? Well, there's multiple uh, uh, validities. There's constru construct validity, which actually measures what it claims to do. There's concurrent validity that correlates well with other tools and tests. There's face validity that resembles real life situations. There's predictive val uh, validity that predicts future performance. And then you need to measure how, you, how, how all these uh, validity assessments that you're doing. So using a Likert scale or a, a task specific checklist is what you can do. Uh, so, what, how do you determine? How many do you need to do? Well, the ACGME residency requirement requires 40 epidurals and 40 spinals. There was a study by Copaz et al. that says that you need about 60 blocks is necessary to achieve a 90% success rate. And in fact, our uh, cardio, um, cardiac anesthesiology colleagues that for TEE basic certification, you need 50 exams uh, with the use of ultrasound or TEE and ultrasound. So it seems to me, if you're just looking outright, anywhere between 40 and 60 is probably what you need to, to have um, adequate competency. This was a nice study by Grau et al. And what it shows is that if you look here, is that uh, they had beginning trainees, residents, starting uh, uh, labor epidurals in, in the OB suite. And this is the, uh, the success rate. And typically what you do one is at least like a 90, 85% success rate. And this is the number of epidurals that the trainees actually did. So 10, 20, all the way up to 60. And if you just did the, the regular standard technique without the use of ultrasound, look how low you go. So you start here, and that's where you come up to this, like needing 60 or so to at least get that 95% success rate. But with the growl showed that with the use of ultrasound, that you maintained a high rate. 85% is what the residents did, even on uh, at 10 epidural insertions. So it definitely improves the learning curve. So this is a study by Maragano and all, and that's with uh, Carvalho in uh, Toronto. And what they did is they had a workshop, and they had reading material, video presentations, a 30-minute hands-on workshop. Uh, they, and then they assessed these, the, the, the workshop uh, uh, attendees one to two weeks later. So they wanted to determine the inner space, the optimal insertion point, and we talked about the angle, uh, the depth to the ligamentum flavum, and they allowed up to 20 trials. So they got, they did the workshop, they did the video, there was a didactic component, and they allowed them up to 20, 20 trials to see uh, how well, how competent they were in doing it. And what they found that was only 27% achieved competence in the determining the, the correct inner space. 
Zero percent of the, per, uh, of the participants were competent to determine insertion point or depth, so they couldn't even do that. So it, their conclusion was that 20 supervised trials in teaching sessions was not sufficient for competence. So it seems to me that you have to do 40 or so or 50 or 60 out on your own. You just can't go to a day course and, and expect to, to be competent. So you have to use it when you, uh, uh, when you get back to your home institution. So it'll give you the information to do it, but you need to use it. So this patient, if they come in, it's not a problem. So placing an epidural and also using ultrasound. But if you're gonna try and use ultrasound in this same type of per person that I had in my previous lecture, it's going to be difficult because you have increased adipose tissue and it's much harder to view it. So if you're going to use ultrasound, you need to practice first in the thinner patients so that when it, you need it, that, that you, you get pretty good and able to um, use it in the obese partorium. Now, one of the things that we did is that at our institution that we have an epidural distance equation. And in our patients at McGee Women's Hospital, there's a, a linear regression, and we came up with a formula. And what I did is I hand this out to all of our uh, uh, trainees when they come in. And based on height and weight, it'll give you an approximate distance to the epidural space. So in conjunction, if you're going to use ultrasound, because there's all this fat and you can't really see and it's really difficult, so approximately it might give you an area where you need to concentrate on. And when you're using the ultrasound, you can say, oh, okay, that says it should be around six, then you can really help to locate it. So we did um, a study and it basically did 160 patients and in morbidly obese patients, and I wanted to see if it would actually uh, work pretty good. And the mean BMI was 44, and what we did is here's the, the correlation coefficient. So by using that, you were able, we were able to maintain a high correlation, so over 0.9, which is uh, very good. So same with uh, uh, the, the transverse and also longitudinal. So in conclusion, for ultrasound, it seems that 20 supervised trials is just not sufficient enough, so you need more than 20. You need historical data suggests at least 40 to 60 exams, and ultrasound is more accurate, like I said, in thinner patients than it is in morbidly obese patients. So practice on the thinner patients first, and much more work needs to be done. I also recommend that if you're going to use ultrasound, you really should use the, the two views. So you can get the x-axis, which is the transverse. You can get the y-axis, which is the longitudinal. And it helps to confirm midline. It gives two points of references. It increases the success rate. And if you need to, you can consider using the, the normogram. And I'm happy to give that to you if you want to. So, Everyone rises to their own level of incompetence, and the, the Peter principle, or Peter's theorem, is that incompetence plus incompetence equals incompetence. So, but if we're going to measure incompetence, it, that's another measure and assessment. Thank you very much.